standing up in McKinney. This is According to Callus, episode 551. And in part, this is a listener requested topic. But I've, but I've expanded the intent and certainly the uh, realm of what I'm going to be doing here. And uh, today we're going to begin a five part series on restating the five parties of the tea or I'm sorry, the five principles of the tea party. And, uh, I'll give you a little history in that and how they play out. And we'll get there in just a moment. But before I get there, let me remind you the biggest thing you can do for me. The big difference that you can, uh, help with here is getting the word out. We do that by following, subscribing, sharing, rating, reviewing, whatever it is that you prefer to do, go to your favorite social media, go to the podcatcher of your choice, hit the follow, hit the subscribe button. It's how we grow the program. It's how we make a difference. Now I got to tell you, I'm very excited. Last week, last week, all but one episode was at or over 1000 downloads. That's the first time that I've managed to do that (laughs) ever. Uh, I think I had 960 something on Friday's episode still and 1300, a thousand. And then I think 970 something on Mondays. So we're there. I mean, we are, we are starting to get it cooking and you know, look, I know my four listeners are about burned out, so I could use a few more here. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is a formula and I'll get to it at some point where I'll uh, tell you how that works. But in any case, I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you joining me. Uh, we do our best, or I should say we, me, I do my best to stay as local as possible. And I'll be honest, I could probably grow this show 10 times its size quite quickly if I would spend more time talking about national topics. And Lord knows there's been enough crazy that's gone on in the last six months that I could devote entire shows and hours and hours to the material that's going on at the federal level or even an international level. But honestly, at the at this point, there's nothing we can do about it. If you live in Texas, there's nothing you can do about it. If you live in any other state, really, there's very little, if anything. In fact, I would just go, nothing you can do about it. The feds are out of control. They're not our friends. And quite frankly, that ship sailed. We need to focus on what we can do. What that means is you have to start local and work your way up to your state. Now, at least in, in my state, in Texas, We have some push, some control of what goes on in Austin. It's not a lot. It's not significant, but it does happen. So let me begin by restating the five principles. Now, I should be clear about this. The Tea Party was a organized uh, disorganization, which is to say there were many, many Tea Parties. Many of them were aligned but not in lockstep. And there really never was a national leader, not a truly legitimate national leader. And it was that way by design, especially my opinion of the matter by design as to not, or to prevent its co-option. Now, unfortunately, as things went on, as, uh, those that said they were on our side spent more time with us, they did eventually successfully in my opinion, co-opt the entirety of the Tea Party and the movement. But that doesn't mean that the movement itself was wrong. It doesn't mean that there weren't a lot of good things accomplished. It doesn't mean that those principles aren't still true and don't matter. So the first principle is personal responsibility, right? We have the five principles, personal responsibility, fiscal responsibility, limited government, and then national or state sovereignty and rule of law. I'm going to do them in a slightly different order just because it suits my purposes. So we're going to be skipping the Texas slash Texit Tuesday this week, and we'll be focusing on fiscal responsibility. On Wednesday, we're going to come back. We're talking about limited government. That might be of interest to some people. I'm just saying. And then Thursday, we're going to talk about the rule of law. And then on Friday... We're going to talk about sovereignty, both national and state sovereignty. Now, that was one of the things that was always overlooked. They would talk about uh, national sovereignty, and I would always reiterate there's state sovereignty in that mix as well. But again, if you're in a state like, say, I don't know, Wisconsin 
or Kansas, you're very much less concerned about your state sovereignty than if you're in Texas, where it kind of still matters. Which, interestingly enough, is also still a big deal out in like Colorado and California, although they're definitely on the other side of the spectrum than we are. So what does that mean? That means that we're going to start Monday, coming to you on the 18th of December, the year of our Lord, 2023, and we're going to talk a little bit about personal responsibility and why it matters. See, if you as an individual cannot take care of yourself, if if you as an individual are, are not interested in looking out after yourself, nobody else is going to do it for you. Nobody else is nearly as concerned about you as you are. Now, I will make an addendum to that. If you're married, your wife or your husband might care more about you than you care about yourself. If your parents are still alive or if you're a young person and obviously your parents are still in the picture, your parents might actually care more for you than you do. That's okay, but the basic premises is it is your responsibility and you need to look after you. Now, that expands out to your family, right? So if you're married with children, that means your spouse, wife, husband, what, whatever that situation is, because I'm talking to both sexes here, your children, you're going to uh, demonstrate that personal responsibility, taking care of your family, as well as teach and train up your children in that way. Right, You want for your children to be able to take care of themselves as well as, at least in theory, you're able to take care of yourself. Now, there is a famous quote by Heinlein who talks about or specialization is for insects. Now, I don't know if I'm going to go necessarily to that degree, but I will say that not everybody's a polymath. Not everybody's a renaissance person, a renaissance man, if you will. That means that they're good at multiple things. They're good at everything. Nobody's that way, at least very few people uh, in the common um, population. Now, my wife likes to refer to me as a renaissance man every once in a while. I got to tell you, it does embarrass me. There are plenty of things I don't do well. There are plenty of things that I wish I could do much better. But as a general rule, if you can do two, three, four things and do them very well, I mean, that's a good start. What's interesting to me is, you know, even professionals, a lot of them have secondary hobbies or secondary um, skills that they have learned or developed over their lifetime. Now, if you set aside, well, I like to play this sport or I like to do this thing and focus on the skills that are uh, related to that hand-eye coordination and whatnot, that could translate into something that could pay your bills, that could uh, serve to protect your you and your family, right? And, and I don't want to get into the details here because it's largely to your own imagination and largely to your own application. Everybody's different. That's one of the key scenarios that liberty lovers rely on is everybody is different. We don't want everybody put in a box. We don't want to confine and tell everybody they must live and must act and must behave like everybody else that they know. Clearly, there's an opportunity to uh, excel in certain things and maybe not excel, but be decent in other things. Now, what does that mean as a as a daily situation? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to your family? Well, if you've got another skill set, if you should lose your job, if you if you should change it up, if you should get hurt, you can find other ways to provide. You can find other ways to take care of yourself. Now, as a curious aside here, just so we're clear, I still make zero money off this podcast. I haven't really started in earnest to monetize it. I know that Podbean will throw ads in on occasion, and I'm happy for that. It makes it makes me feel good that I actually get enough people showing up and listening to justify somebody wanting to run an ad. But as a as a secondary source of income, yeah, it's not there. I have a regular full-time job. I have this gig, this job that I do. And then I have my political job, right? I have three things that I'm doing. That's about what most people can do and do well. Now, there are people that can run five or six 
side gigs and still have a regular job. There are other people that they are tapped out. They have one all encompassing full time job. And here's the thing. No example is wrong. It's what works for you. It's what you're capable of doing. There is no shame in that. I would encourage you to look at other things. I would encourage you to determine if you have additional skill sets. I would encourage you to invest the time in yourself or your family. But more importantly, training up your child. One of the things that I did, um, my daughters, before they got their driver's license and they could start driving the car, they had to demonstrate to me that they could change a tire. They had, to, they had to take this, take the tire off or jack up the vehicle, take the tire off, put the spare or put a replacement tire on, tighten up the lug nuts properly, lower the vehicle down and drive it and drive it safely. I mean, that's a bare minimum thing. Now I got to be honest. I didn't teach them anything about changing the oil because honestly, Nobody changes their oil anymore. Not in the city. Now out in the country, look, and if I lived out in the country, yeah, I would take the time and effort because then it would be a 20 or 30 minute drive to get to a facility with change your oil. They're going to charge you your 70 bucks or whatever it is for an oil change these days. I do know. I just know it's different for every vehicle. So I'm trying not to project that on you. And you're going to sit there for an hour to two hours to get that done. And then you're going to go back about your business day or go home. So maybe, just maybe at this point in time, three to four hours of time and effort plus the cost of the materials, it's more cost effective to go have somebody change their own oil. I'll tell you right now, I can do it. No problem. I have probably 90% of the tools I need on hand easily, including drive up uh, stands to where I could crawl underneath there and do it. But I'm kind of old, kind of out of shape, don't feel like crawling underneath my vehicle if I don't have to. Plus, there is a warranty involved. And it's somebody else's responsibility, mine, because I bought the warranty, to take care of the vehicle and to maintain the vehicle so that if I should have a problem, their responsibility kicks in first before mine does. Now, that was a trade-off I made. Now, 20 years ago, probably wouldn't have done that. That being said... I have a skill set that I feel comfortable working on probably 75% of the components in an automobile and work and fixing it. You ask me to go in and rebuild the transmission. I'm going to tell you, no, I'll take a pass. That doesn't mean I couldn't do it. Doesn't mean if you gave me an instruction booklet, I couldn't work my way through it. I mean, it's a very uh, involved erector set or Lego set, if you will. But if you do it wrong, it's thousands of dollars and you're stuck on the side of the road. So unless you're adept at that, unless you're skilled on that, trained in it, it's probably not your best choice. But could you change out spark plugs? Sure, yeah. And honestly, probably until 20 years ago, everybody should have known how to change out a spark plug. Today's day and age, oh, it's a different story between the coal on plug and the (laughs) head's that uh, strip out when you don't take the uh, spark plugs out correctly. Thank you, Ford. There's a lot of different things there, right? So, I mean, and I'm just talking about cars because I had a whole other career in the automotive service business once upon a time. So I turned wrenches and I worked my way up. It's, It's secondary skills. If I have to go fix my car, I am capable of doing it. I just choose not to. It doesn't necessarily benefit me to fix my own vehicle at this point in time. I would rather have an expert do it. You're trading your money or your time for somebody else's time. It's an investment. That is part of your personal responsibility, determining what you're best suited to do, and what's the best way to take care of things. Now, how else does that translate? Well, if you don't train up your children well, they're not going to be able to take care of yourself. Now, we often joke about the millennials not being able to take care of themselves. By and, by and large, the evidence I have seen indicates there's a lot of truth to that. Unfortunately, that reflects poorly on we, Gen X parents, as well as the boomer parents, because it's our job to train up those children, to become young adults, to know how to take care of themselves. Now, I will give credit where credit is due. I do know plenty of millennials that take the time 
to go watch videos on YouTube and study things and learn how to do it for themselves because, quite frankly, they weren't brought up doing it that way. Although, as a secondary note, it should be noted that most of Gen X had to learn to do most everything on their own anyway, so we naturally assumed that our children would do the same. That doesn't mean that you don't show them. It doesn't mean that you don't invest the time with them. But at the end of the day, if you're going to be personally responsible for yourself and your family, you have to also train up your children to be personally responsible. Now, that's a tough pill to swallow. What is it? What else does that entail? Well, it means being able to maintain a house. At the bare minimum, you know how to cut your lawn. Believe me, apparently people don't know how to do that. You know how to put some paint up. You know how to clean windows. You need to know how to scour a sink, clean a toilet, sweep your floors or vacuum carpets. I can do all those things. I've done all those things. In fact, I'm quite good at them. I don't like them. I don't enjoy them. And But when I have time, guess what? I do it. I pay people to do it sometimes too because you only have so much time and so much effort you can invest into doing that. But if you don't know how to do it, that means you can't do it. And maybe you're not in a position in life that you can afford to trade your money for that. There's no shame in that. That's To me, that's the strangest thing. People feel like a lot of jobs are beneath them, that it's shameful to do that. And I've never felt that way about anything. Now, there are certain things I wouldn't necessarily enjoy doing, but if it's between eating or not eating or taking care of my family or not take care of your family and somebody says, I need you to go work in the sewer, well, give me the overalls. Let's get it done. That's what you got to do. Now, you can make choices. You, If you're skilled beyond that in doing different things, you might be able to do that. But to call a plumber unskilled is so foolish. Don't ever do that. When you talk to your skilled tradespeople, I'll be honest, a good number of them are probably making more money than you are as a basic professional. If you're sitting in front of a keyboard all day, I'll be willing to just hazard a guess unless you're making a quarter million or more. That plumber, that electrician, that welder, yeah, they're doing better than you are. Now they have to work a lot of hours. They put in a lot of effort. They get dirty. But hey. I know automotive technicians that were making a ton more money than I was back in the day because it's a skilled labor position and you have to know what you're doing in order to do it. But again, this is part of being personally responsible, looking after yourself, learning that skill, building up a trade, building up a a skill set and running things. Now, Now, once you step out of your family, right? Being personally responsible also means that you have to look out for what's going on around you. The things that affect your family affect you. Now, whether that's the church you attend and they're going full woke. Now, maybe that's something you like. I I can't imagine you're listening to me at 550 episodes in still. But if it's you and you're actually quite comfortable with the egalitarian pro... pro, um, We're just going to leave it. If you like that flag out front, that ain't a Christian flag, you're probably not going to be listening to me, but that's fine for you. You're wrong. Absolutely wrong. I believe it in my heart and fairly certain that the Bible that we claim to follow is clear on that as well. But in the event that that's your thing, I'm not going to have that argument. I'm just going to say, fine, whatever. But the rest of us, yeah, we don't have time for that. But how do we show personal responsibility? Well, we have to be willing to say no. We have to be willing to maybe withdraw our money, our support from that church or that organization. Maybe we have to say, go visit with somebody and talk to them. Now, unfortunately, in today's day and age, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of effort to manipulate people, usually through money, to cave in on these issues. They're saying, oh, they're secondary. They don't really matter. We're all inclusive. Love is love. God loves everybody. All that stuff's there. So you're kind of fighting that uphill battle, but it doesn't mean you quit. It doesn't mean you surrender. But part of that personal responsibility is knowing when to say when. Maybe you choose to walk away. Maybe you look for a better place of worship. Maybe you go have that long, heartfelt discussion with the pastor or elder or deacon or whatever the situation is in your church. And I'm going to be honest. I haven't been driven to that point yet, but I'm very well. I'm acutely aware at some point in the future, I might need to have that conversation. 
I know people that have had that conversation. But that's that's part of being personally responsible. If you're a part of an organization that starts working against you and your values, you have two, really three options. Leave, try and fix it, or go along. And I don't know about you, but I'm not much for going along. <laughs> not when you're going off the rails. Now, secondarily, or uh, secondarily, <laughs> Thirdly, perhaps, or in addition to all of this, right? You started with yourself, you yourself, you moved on to your family. How can you affect your family and train up your family to take responsibility for themselves? And really, and I want to make sure I cover this before I go any further. Responsibility for yourself means when you make a mistake, which is bound to happen, we're all human. When you make a mistake, you own it. You face the consequences. You, you take it head on. You don't lie. You don't make excuses. You don't try and dodge responsibility. You accept it. Now, sometimes bad things happen. So, sometimes there are consequences that are very uncomfortable. They're expensive. They're challenging. They're detrimental. I've had to live with some of the consequences of my foolish decisions when I was a young man. Now, fortunately, none of them involved you know, spending time in jail or steep fines, but there still were consequences. There still were things, there were impediments to my success later on in life, but you work past them. You own them and you keep going. You keep working. That translates into your family. You demonstrate that for your children and you hopefully train them up to do the same thing. And honestly, you want them to avoid those mistakes that you made, especially if you've made some more critical mistakes than I have. Mine have not been easy, but they didn't have any of the uber long-term consequences of all, oh, I don't know, spending time in jail, but you don't want that. You don't want that for yourself. You don't want that for your children. Now, as we move on that personal responsibility, you're demonstrating and you're expecting it. And to some degrees, you're demanding that from other people. Now, what do I mean by that? When government gets involved, they seek to get involved in your life and they seek to override your personal responsibility. In fact, they seek to take away your ability to be personally responsible. And this is where you have to be willing to say, no, I don't want your free government cheese. No, I don't want this benefit, quote unquote, that you're going to provide me. I'm just fine the way it is. I will take care of myself. I will look after my family. And guess what? If I have struggle or if I have a problem, I have extended family. We'll work this out amongst ourselves. We look out for each other because we're part of a family. Guess what? Beyond that, and this is where your church comes in, we kind of have a tribe here. Yeah, I know. I use that word again. A tribe has many different ways to be utilized or explained or understood. But the reality is it's a group of people that aren't necessarily directly connected by blood. They are, but it's more extended. It's more involved. It takes in other people that aren't directly related because they've married it or they've joined it. Tell me how that's not like most churches, right? You look out for each other. You build a net that, that covers all the people that you're involved with. You look out for one another. You build that responsibility in. I'm responsible for my brother because we belong to the same church or we belong to the same temple or we belong. You follow me here? You're looking out for your fellow man that you're in good terms with, that you treat like extended family. That is how you build up that personal responsibility. And at some point in the future, that person's going to be able to pay it forward as well. That person's going to be able to help somebody else out. Now, I've been on both sides of this coin. I've received help from people in the past, and I have helped people in the past. There's no shame in this either way. Now, I got to tell you, it was a tough pill to swallow. <laughs> I did not enjoy being in a position where I had to rely on somebody else to help me out or get me out of a sticky situation or take somebody else's money or help without being able to return something, without being able to do something to earn it. That's a struggle. When <laughs> when you're when you're raised to be able to take care of yourself, you don't like to just take a handout. There's something wrong with that in your mind. It's ingrained that you don't just take something for nothing. And you know what? That's also part of personal responsibility. The idea that you should be able to get things for nothing, 
That should bother you. I, I don't care what anybody says. I think it's a good value that it bothers you. Now, you need to be able to ride it. You need to be able to understand that some things are beyond your capabilities. Some things are on beyond what you can do and handle on your own or even within your direct blood family. But that's part of the purpose of having this talk. If you cannot accept that personal responsibility also means you need to own your shortcomings, you're never going to be able to make do with it. You're never going to be able to move forward. This is all part of life. It's understanding what you can do and what you can't do, right? The serenity prayer fuel talks about this. It's, a, it's an opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to expand. It's an opportunity to learn to rely on your brothers and sisters. Part of personal responsibility is setting an example. And part of that personal responsibility is taking help when you need it and knowing when it's appropriate. In looking out for your brothers and sisters, metaphorically and legitimately, investing that time, that energy into things. But you have to own it and you have to be self-motivated. You have to put in the effort. Everything you do is a reflection on you and who you serve, whether it's your family or God, it's a reflection. And you have to be able to do that in good conscience and you have to be able to do a good job with it. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm kind of at the end. I don't have much more to say about personal responsibility in the context of the five principles, but I'll be back tomorrow and we'll work on fiscal responsibility. And with that, this has been According to Callus, and I will see you on the other side.